Hello and uh, welcome to this lecture on BC 310 on Church and Ministry Administration. I am uh, pre-recording this lecture because I'm uh, traveling this week on ministry. I'll be in another city uh, ministering uh, Wednesday to Saturday. So uh, I thought I'll just pre-record at least one lecture so that we can keep things going. And uh, yeah, so I hope um, you can uh, you find this lecture okay, uh, even though it's pre-recorded. Let's pray and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for this opportunity uh, to gather together online and learn. I thank you for all those who will be watching this video lecture and uh, I pray that uh, the information that we uh, share will be useful to each of us, Lord, that uh, uh, we will be able to uh, carry out the work you've called us to do very well, the ministries you've given to us, the local churches that we care for, that will do the work well. Uh, fill us with your wisdom and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So today we are going to pick up in lesson number 12. If you remember last week, we um, spent time talking about uh, accounting and finance, uh, those aspects of the ministry. Now, uh, I realize some of you may have some questions on it. We will pick it up uh, when we come back in person this week and also next week, I will be doing pre-recorded lectures. So there won't be that uh, opportunity for interaction. But when uh, we get back um, to be in person, uh, please feel free to ask me questions on uh, what we did last week on finance, plus the things that we'll be doing this week and next week through the pre-recorded lectures. Today we'll be in lesson number 12. I want to talk a little bit about um, the legal aspects of uh, uh, church and ministry administration. Now, this is also an important part of um, uh, doing or carrying out a ministry. And in fact, just earlier today, uh, I was on a call with some leaders of uh, a church in another part of our country and uh, they actually started their ministry several years ago and they have grown and they have many churches they have spread across many states and uh, suddenly they realized that um, they have really not been uh, doing the the legal side of things uh, which is the filing of annual returns, documents it's supposed to be filing with the government um, that hasn't, you know, for whatever reason, they have not been doing it. And so, you know, they just, just, just reached out to get get on a call and talk about, you know, how, how, how should we do these things now? They like to get things back in order. And so we just shared some thoughts and insights and also pointed them to uh, qualified people who will be able to help them. But the reality is that even though we are involved in Christian ministry, we are busy preaching and teaching the word of God and ministering to people, we are still accountable legally to the civil government. Uh, and so there are different aspects in which we need to uh, be accountable. You know, we just can't go about doing our own things any way we wish, but we've got to follow the rules of the land, the laws of the land. Uh, and these laws are meant to keep every organization, not just churches, but every organization on track, follow certain rules. And this is the way you have to conduct yourself. And this is how you have to report back to the government. So the legal aspects um, are, are very important. Now, um, I would first of all um, begin just by outlining the fact that uh, when we uh, uh, when we have a legal entity, whether it's a church or a Christian ministry, uh, you know the trustees or the members of the trust, which you know we mentioned it in the very beginning, you need to form a legal entity. Now, from time to time, you may 
these members of the trustees may change, which means that, uh, you know, people may resign and new people may come on board, uh, which is normal for any legal entity. There will be these times of transition, um, but this has to be done legally. That means um, this has to be documented and reported back to the government saying um, these people have stepped down. These are the new trustees or the new members of this legal entity. So that that is not just an arbitrary change. Just we understand among ourselves and say, okay, you become a trustee, you become a member, and we don't do that. You know, it has to be done legally. It's a legal process to change the trustees and the members of the trust. So um, remember, we need to keep be mindful of it. Uh, do all the necessary paperwork. Uh, register that with the government when, if there's a change or when there's a change of uh, the legal trustees or the members of the trust. Another important thing is to uh, record the meetings and major decisions that are made. This again is a requirement. Now, uh, obviously, uh, the the uh, government is not going to come and check these things every month but uh if and when you know uh, they ask for such record records of meetings by the trustees and decisions being made we should be able to supply it so provide it so it's important to record these things um of the meetings, the decisions in a very formal way, maybe in a document, in a book or in a document or some way that, you know, a meeting took place and this this was the decisions made and you have the trustee sign it off, sign off on it and you record it so that if and when uh, that is asked for, we may, we may be able to submit it and also just for the benefit of the organization itself that important meetings and decisions are recorded so that in the future when you know other people are leading the organization other people are responsible for the organization they have a reference point to go back and uh, understand why certain decisions were made or uh, you know uh, how they were made etc or when they were made so on and so forth so it's important to record important meetings and decisions sometimes People may just record it in a log book and write it down, or they may type it out and have sign. People have people sign it and file it. Whatever way, uh, these the decisions made by the trustees and members should be recorded and kept on by. So these are two important things. Just remember from a legal standpoint. Another important uh, thing to keep in mind is that the government in most places will the government requires every entity, every legal entity, which includes the religious organizations, churches and Christian ministries, ministries to make certain filings, uh, meaning reports filed with their um, with their respective offices. So, for instance, we have um, um, uh, filings of um, uh, our audited uh, statements, we have uh, filings to ob obtain certain permissions that need to be done, you know, to get that religion um, tax exemption. Uh, so there, there are certain documents have to be filed. Uh, our, uh, and I mentioned under accounting that when we deduct tax, that has to be paid back to the government and so on and so forth. So. Uh, whatever is needed, the filings and the compliance, they have to be maintained. Now, of course, as a pastor, you you're not yourself are not going to do this personally, but you are going to get the help of a chartered accountant. You're going to help get the help of uh, uh, the right people to re report these things uh, periodically. Right? So at APC, we we have our, as we mentioned, our accountant in house. We have an external accountant. We have the auditing firm. They take care of all of these filings. They make sure that you know month on month these documents or this this information is filed with the government so that everything is kept up to date. So we never slack or never fall fall short of any of these things. So everything is kept up to date year on year, and whatever we need to report to the government, reports are done. Um, 
Another important thing is that when property is purchased, which generally would happen in a typical church setting as a church grows, the church would want to buy land and build a building or things like that. Uh, always remember, all property must be purchased in the name of the church. It doesn't belong to any individual. It belongs to the local church because it is bought with the money that has been contributed to the local church. So that has to be very careful. You have to be very careful of that. You're never, you're never going to buy property in the name of an individual. That's, that's, that's not allowed. Um, and so everything has to be done clean. Uh, you know, what belongs to the church remains with the church. Um, another, another aspect of um, the, the legal side is that uh, from, you know, there can be sometimes um, people who may, you know, file complaints against the church or against the ministry. And uh, sometimes it happens in the form of, uh, you know, people just objecting to our preaching of the gospel, uh, to our winning of lost souls. They may go and file complaints and so on. And, and these things happen in different parts of our country. Uh, and uh, so this is where we have to appeal in the court or appeal in the police station initially and later on in the court um, uh, and need to get lawyers involved. Uh, you know, and, and this happens now and then. So in India, uh, we have some organizations that help um, uh, those who are being persecuted in this manner. Uh, and, and so they are a network, uh, ADF India. And for instance, uh, and even persecution relief, they have a network of lawyers. And so we can reach out to them and they will guide us. They will tell us, okay, this is what you need to do in this situation. And we have used their help in times past, you know, when one of our churches um, on, on multiple occasions, actually, people came to disrupt the service, they came to interrupt the service. And, uh, you know, we were just having a regular church service in, in one of one of our north church locations, North India, and they came and disrupted, and so we had to go to the police, and it became a big, uh, big thing. But we reached out to you know the lawyers. They told us exactly what to do. How do we, you know, write the report? How do we file the report? What are we supposed to do? The the legal process that we had to follow, uh, and so on. So. Uh, it's important that even at such times, we ha do have access to lawyers, to people who know uh, the law and how we have to follow the law, what we're supposed to do in order to defend ourselves uh, when it comes to uh, these kinds of situations. So it's important to you know have these things in ready. It's not that this, these things happen every day, but uh, as and when and if and these kinds of things happen, we should have access to uh, people who can guide us and provide us the right information legally on how to handle matters at the police station or in the courts and so on. Um, so that's just a little brief about the legal side. Uh, I know that uh, uh, we generally don't want to get involved with these things, but the fact is when we are operating in uh, the world, in, we need to make sure of these things and uh, need to be accountable. I'm going to move now to another aspect of uh, church and ministry administration, and it's something uh, we will encounter more frequently, uh, which is planning, execution, and coordination. So, in the church or in the ministry, there are a lot of things that are happening, a lot of ministries that are happening, a lot of events and conferences and projects that could be happening. And all of these things don't just happen arb arbitrarily. You know, you don't just get up and say, okay, we, I'm going to start a ministry or, mm, oh, we're going to have an event or we're going to do this project. You know, uh, for many of these ministries to take place, we need what... You know, we need good planning, uh, good execution, good coordination. Okay. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about this whole aspect. Now, as a pastor, 
uh, you know, or as a leader of the Christian ministry, there may be times you will be directly involved in a lot of these things. Uh, it's part of, you know, leading a ministry, leading a church. Now, it'll be great if we can reach a point in time where this can actually be delegated to someone else and say, hey, you know, you oversee the term, the administration, you oversee the planning, the execution, the coordination of all the areas of ministries and conferences and events and so on. Um, but even then, you need to oversee. They will they will refer back to you for important decisions or for guidance on what to do in certain situations. So uh, it's almost uh, you know almost given that whether you are a pastor or the leader of a Christian ministry, to some degree you will have to be involved in the planning, execution, and coordination of the various ministries and the various projects and the conferences and the events that are happening, it will require that skill. And in fact, uh, we need to have really good skill uh, in this area. Now, when you look at planning uh, from a biblical perspective, you know, there are two sides to this. One side where we see in Matthew chapter 6, Verse 25 to 34, uh, Jesus says, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you're going to eat and drink and wear. And um, now uh, don't worry about life because your Heavenly Father knows you have need of these things. He says, don't worry, have faith. Uh, similarly, in James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, James wow. says, you know, uh, come on now, you, you just can't say that you'll go to this such and such a city and do such and such a business and make such and such a living. No, you need to say, if the Lord wills, this and this will happen. In other words, he's emphasizing the fact that we need, we are completely dependent on God and we ourselves are not determinants of uh, uh, the entire outcome. We are depending on God. And these are true, you know, we don't need to be worried about tomorrow. We don't need to be concerned about tomorrow. And we are truly dependent on God for tomorrow, for the future. Having said that, the Bible also teaches us on the other side. For example, in Proverbs 6, 6 through 11, uh, God says, you know, go look at the ant. Go learn a lesson from the ant. The ant doesn't have a leader. Yet it knows how to gather its food in summer to prepare for the winter. That means the ant is so-called so planning well in advance. It's looking ahead and gathering in summer what it needs for the winter, for when times when it cannot gather. And the Bible teaches us you know, to ponder the path of our feet, to think thoroughly uh, the path in which we are going. So that is also there. And our God is a God of plan, right? So God himself planned ahead of time of what he's going to do and how he's going to unfold things. So God saw through time and he decided when in the fullness of time he would send his son and so on. So there are two sides to it. One is we're not living in a state of worry or anxiety about tomorrow. Uh, we're not you know, thinking that We've got everything in our hands about tomorrow. No, we're completely dependent on God. And yet on the other hand, we do have foresight. We live with prudence. We try to think ahead. We try to plan ahead without being worried about tomorrow or without thinking that we are in control of everything. No. So we need to balance the two and learn how to do our planning, everything well, and still learn to walk by faith, trust, and dependence on God. Think about what the Bible says here. And all of these are from the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs says that a prudent man acts with knowledge. That means he gets information and then he takes action. A prudent man understands his way. That means he's thinking about the way in which he's going. And he's not just going blindly and he's not just saying, I'll go wherever life takes me. A prudent man considers well his steps. He's thinking about every step he's taking. You know, yes, there may be some risks involved. There may be uncertainty. There may be uh, things that, you know, clear, that are not very clear, but to the best he can, he's considering well his steps. A prudent man receives correction. That means when people tell him, hey, 
watch out for this or don't do this. He's willing, he's discussing, he's thinking. A prudent man acquires knowledge. Uh, a prudent man foresees evil. That means he's, he's looking ahead and uh, try and, uh, you know, um, uh, preempting danger, preempting things that could go wrong. He's foreseeing evil and he's taking action ahead of time. So all of these things are indicative to us that we use our mind, we think, we plan, uh, we receive information, receive correction, receive guidance, and we are planning or looking ahead about things and how we live life. So we're not just blindly going through life, but we're thinking, we are planning. And so we take these these truths and apply them to ministry, apply them to church, apply them to how we go about doing things uh, in, in church and in ministry. Right? So that's where this whole aspect of planning, project planning comes in, uh, execution, coordination, these things come into play, that we are doing things with understanding, we're doing things, uh, we're acting with knowledge. So generally when you think about executing a project uh, for that matter if you're planning an event a conference let's say a plan a con next year planning to have a conference um, usually every year we have multiple con many conferences you know. so we always plan we fix the dates well ahead of time we fix on the theme and then we start working towards it so it's like a small project or a, a, a certain area of ministry that itself is like can be managed like a project so what are, how, how do we go about doing a typical project or managing a typical project so these are this is all general information which i think we can learn from and we can make use in our churches in our ministries in how we uh, run our projects there are five stages if you for a project or we call it the project life cycle you know um, there's the initiating stage planning executing monitoring and closure or closing and there are certain tasks or activities that are done in each of these stages of the project right? and we'll, we'll talk about this but typically uh, when you are initiating you want to understand what the project is, what are the goals, what are the objectives of the project. Uh, you want to get an overview or, or an, a you know, high level understanding of what this project is all about. Why are you doing it? Secondly, and, and, and then we start planning. It's so, okay. What are the resources do I, that I need? And what is the time, the money, the kind of people we need? Uh, and uh, how is it going to be done? What are the activities that will be taking place? So you are planning things out. You're thinking through the whole uh, process of cutting this project out. Then comes obviously the execution. That means, okay, now let's jump in. Let's start working on things. And uh, execution of the project begins to happen. You're actually carrying out the work to get the project done. And while execution is happening, you're monitoring. Right? That means you're measuring and controlling. Okay, you're saying you're checking on, you know, the time, the resources being used, the people being allocated, the tasks that are being completed, the progress that's being made. So you're measuring all of these. And if anything is out of line, you need to bring it back in line or put things back in control. So while execution is happening, you're also monitoring, you're looking at how things are going. And then finally, when the objectives have been met, the project is complete, you want to bring it to a close, which usually will, will review everything. How did we do? Uh, did we achieve our objectives? What did we do well? What did we not do well? Uh, what can we improve the next time around, uh, et cetera? You know, and so you kind of assess the whole project and, and uh, bring, bring, some, bring it to a close. So, what are things that will ensure that the project is successful? So whether you are planning, carrying out a particular area of ministry or conference or <coughs> a 
special mission trip, whatever. What are key success factors? You know, some important things are we need to have a clearly defined objective. You know, what are we trying to achieve? You know, what's the objective? Uh, we need to have a practical timeline. You know, how, how, when, by when should this get done? Does it, does it need to be done in six months, six years? What is the timeline? Any good leadership, people who can lead others, lead the project, and give oversights to bringing everything together and making sure things happen. Uh, we need a good team, or in some cases, multiple teams, people with the right skills, people who are committed to the project. Uh, we need good management. That means there's going to be constant review, feedback, and improvements. That's the role of a manager, checking constantly and you know, uh, giving feedback, improving things, having to be able to overcome problems. So that there may be internal problems, there may be external problems. We need to be able to resolve these. And of course, we need to finish. We need to go through the finish line, make sure we complete what we started to complete. Right? So all of these are factors that determine whether we would be successful in something. Now, I'd usually like to pause and ask, you know, uh, does, do you have any questions? And I can't do that because this is being pre-recorded. But, uh, you know, uh, if you have any thoughts or questions, uh, we will definitely pick it up uh, in two weeks from now when we meet in person. Right? So just write down your questions in your notebook somewhere or, uh, and then please bring it up when we meet in person. So. When we initiate the project, like, you know, we kind of drill into the details of this. When we are initiating the project, key things are we need to have a plan, uh, which is the objectives, general idea of by how quickly we need to get it done, what is the money that's allo allocated for this, or what money will be available, the kinds of people that we can bring on board, and uh, Sorry. Um, we need to look into the uh, whether we can have a project manager or a team leader to lead this project uh, so that that person can acquire, find, get the resources together, or overcome any challenges, provide leadership, uh, uh, negotiate, you know, engage in conflict resolution persuading people, establish credibility. So these are qualities that, you know, that we would need in a, in a project manager, team leader. They need to be sensitive, show a good leadership uh, style that matches our culture and the people we are leading, good eth ethics, and obviously the ability to handle stress because uh, the biggest st stress, the most stress is on the leader, on the project manager, the person in charge, uh, he's got to handle have the ability to handle stress. And then we also think about the project team. You know, uh, what are the skills we need for and the people uh, so that things can get done on the required project timeline. So these are the kind of things we think about, we talk about, we try to identify the initiating stage. And then uh, getting into the planning is when, okay, we know we want to get it done in two years or whatever that timeline is. Now let's break it down. You know, so you break it down into smaller tasks. Uh, so that's where you come up with a project schedule. Uh, now that you can get into the details, it's, we can arrive at a better cost estimation of each step along the way so that we can monitor and say that we are, we are on track, we are not overspending. Uh, what are the activities that are going to be involved? Uh, who's going to be doing them? The resource allocation, and then the how are we going to assess if there's a risk and how do we mitigate it? So these are things we think about ahead of time and work on as we plan something, uh, plan the project, whether it's a ministry or a conference or an event that we're planning on an actual project we're planning to carry on. Then, while we are executing the project, 
there's a lot of interaction. How is the team going to interact? How are people going to communicate with each other? Now we can use email, we can use uh, messaging on phones, we can use in-person meetings, so on and so forth. Uh, so we need to think about that and make sure those communications happen. How do we keep our team motivated? How do we keep the people motivated? If people tend to, you know, um, lose interest, lose passion, slack off and so on, how do we keep them unmotivated? That's a, another important part of um, uh, the project. Uh, regular review meetings so that you can uh, monitor the progress. You know, maybe you can could be a weekly meetings, could be a monthly meetings, but you're reviewing. You know, how are things going? Uh, are things going as we planned, and so on. If there are problems, uh, we need to resolve those problems uh, while the project is being executed. There's there's a lot of purchasing that could happen. Or we need to purchase equipment, purchase different things, and so on. And then also reporting has to be done. We must keep the leadership, keep the right people informed of the progress. And they may even ask, and they want to know how are things happening. So these are things we need to consider during the uh, execution phase. phase. During our monitoring, uh, as during our execution, we are also monitoring. We're also looking at how things are progressing, and some of the things uh, we need is uh, we are measuring and controlling. So this is example: money, time, people. These are things we're looking at. You know, are we overspending? Are we are we you know are we spending more time than previously anticipated? And if, if any of these things are you know, going out of what was planned, how do we bring it back? How do we keep things uh, aligned to as close to as possible to our plan? Uh, expanding scope. What if the project is becoming bigger than you thought it was? Or there are additional things people are saying we should be doing, which you know, wasn't, was not anticipated or uh, budgeted for or planned for. How do we control that? Should we say yes? Should we say no? What do we say yes to? What do we say no to? These are things that we need to think about. And obviously, are the costs increasing? If costs are going beyond what was budgeted, how do we control those costs? Uh, how do you monitor people? Are people giving their best? Are people working well? Are people cared for? Are they all happy? So on and so forth. Uh, what's the quality of the work that's being done? And are things are on are things on schedule? So these are things that we do when you're monitoring uh, the progress of the project or the ministry or uh, the preparation for a conference. And lastly, the last thing I just want to mention today is that uh, when you're done with the project or the event, it's good to always assess, review what's happening, uh, look at the actual versus estimate. So we had estimated or budgeted this, but what is the actual? And then you try to take some lessons out of this whole experience. So you review and you take in uh, insights for the future. So this is also very, very important. Uh, so we do this for every uh, major event or conference. Uh, we'll review. So what went right, what went wrong? Uh, we look at the, the expense. And this is what we estimated. This is what was the actual. Are we okay? Where did we go over? And what can we learn from this whole experience? And how, how can we make sure we don't make the same mistakes again? And how can we preempt certain mistakes? So this closing phase is also very important so that we can keep improving as we do these projects or ministries or conferences mm -hmm. and so on. So it's important to think about these things. All right. So I'm going to pause here for today. Uh, we'll pick this up next week. Next week, I'm going to talk about project management methodologies. And these are just uh, ideas on how you can run uh, projects and different ways to run it. And, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 again, these, these, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, you know, in church or ministry, you will be very, you'll do these things very tightly. But uh, it's good to know these things so that you can use them if you feel these are appropriate. So we'll talk about that next week and uh, share some thoughts on it. 
Now, what I want us to do is think about, you know, maybe think about how you can apply these for the work you're doing. Now, so for example, we've uh, listed out some, uh, uh, some exercises, you know, if you, and these are just sample projects and uh, uh, these are things that are, we have actually done or uh, in some way, so not necessarily exactly, but some way, but these are some things that you could think about, or maybe you think about a, tip, a work that you're already doing. You know, so for example, suppose we have a project where we say, look, in the next year, uh, uh, you, you, you know, the, the worship team has to release an album with at least eight songs. Uh, we need to have, we need to write about 16 songs and then produce about eight songs. So you you have about 12 months and you have about uh, you know, 3 million rupees, 30 lakhs, uh, you know, to, uh, assigned for this project. How would you go about planning it? And this is a typical thing which uh, our worship leader and worship team had to work with, a uh, typical example. Or think about if you have to host a conference, you have one year to prepare and plan uh, to host a Christian arts conference. We're going to bring in uh, artists from different parts of the world. How would you go about planning for this and actually doing it? Or if you were going to run a two month short term Bible college, you know, um, and with, with all of these, you know, these are the objectives. How would you do it? Or, uh, you know, how do, you want to run a resource, set up and run a resource center or host a uh, Christian Leaders Conference or launch a Bible College Student Portal. Now, these are all real projects. And so uh, I want you to just think about, you know, if you, if you apply these five things, the initial phase, planning phase, execution, monitoring, and closing, if you would apply these five phases to each, to any one of these as a project, how would you go about it? You know, what would it look like? At least in your mind, work through it or on a piece of paper, write it out, you know, think through it. And these are all Christian, these are all real ministry related things. And in fact, all of these uh, we have done as a church. And that's why I put these uh, samples here. Uh, yeah, except for this resource center that's not been set up yet, but that's something looking into the future. Uh, so uh, you, know, you could use some of these projects as samples to think about, or maybe something that you're already doing. And I want you to think about this whole, how would you apply these, this, this project life cycle, this project management life cycle, or these five steps? How would you break this whole project down into these five steps? What would it look like? It's useful if you write it down or you think, think through it uh, mentally. Uh, so if you can, in the next lecture hour, uh, we won't have a lecture, but I encourage you to use that time, or you can do it any other time, uh, to think on one of more of these sample projects, or maybe a project that you have already happening in your church or ministry, and think about how you would apply these um, five steps that we, or five stages that we spoke of uh, to that particular project, right? So just think about it. It's not an assignment you need to submit. It's just for you to apply uh, what we spoke about in terms of project management uh, uh, and uh, planning for a project. And uh, definitely in ministry, this whole thing of planning, execution, and coordination is something uh, that we need to be able to do so that you know we can run the ministries or areas of ministries very well. Okay, so let's pause here for today. I uh, will be pray and close, and, and uh, I know this is a pre-recorded uh, lecture, so uh, you know we don't have the opportunity to ask questions and interact. But hopefully, uh, we'll be able to do that in uh, two weeks from now. Okay, let's pray and close. Father, we thank you for the learning that could happen today through this lecture. 
Uh, I pray for everyone who listened to this lecture. I pray that they will be uh, encouraged to think about how to plan and execute and coordinate their areas of ministries and uh, things that they do even better with excellence so that he can serve you well and serve people well. We thank you for your wisdom given to us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, each one. And we will, uh, next week, uh, I'll have to do the same thing. I'll be, again, traveling, so I'll do a pre-recorded lecture next week. And the following week, we will meet. Thank you. Bye now. Have a good day.